Okay, everyone, welcome to, uh, to our webinar tonight, our, um, our fantastic uh, Sydney Project Encore. So um, I want to take the opportunity to thank Samir very much and Mark from the Sydney Project for joining us tonight and um, doing this presentation. I won't say again, because I think it's actually a bit of a new presentation. So I'm um, really, really lucky. Mm -hmm. So for those that don't know um, about the Sydney Project, um, they're a great group of guys here, uh, based here in Sydney. And um, basically their mission is to feel, find, film, and document the wrecks of lost ships, solving the mysteries of unfinished voyages and writing their untold stories. Um, they do some amazing stuff here in Sydney, doing a lot of diving off of our boat here. Um, lately, they've been mapping the Tunk Hurry. Um, and I won't go into too much detail. I'm going to hand you over to Samir, who's going to talk to us a bit more about wrecks and mapping wrecks and some of the great um, stories underwater. So, Samir, Mark, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. Um, um, yeah. All right. So, guys, um, as you probably, uh, some of you um, would have seen previously in some of the presentations um, that we've done, we tend to speak about... Um, things like the wrecks on the south coast of New South Wales that we've previously done and we're still doing to this day. But I thought, you know what, um, um, just wanted to get something a little bit different uh, for this particular presentation and um, show you something that um, not necessarily we're doing local. So I'm just going to quickly start the screen the presentation so that, oops to the back and uh, hopefully I don't stuff up the sharing no share the screen okay everyone can see this yeah yep. all right cool so um, so I thought uh, you know what um, let's do something a little bit different we like I said we always talk about you know the wrecks that we do locally and all that but why not um, talk about some of the overseas um, trips and expeditions that we were involved with, because some of them are really cool. And um, some of these overseas ones sort of come about um, just through our, sort of our connections, um, sort of with Mark knowing um, people, you know, within the uh, heritage office or some of the other um, expeditions he was previously involved with, like the AU2. Um, so, you know what, um, and I thought, why not invite Mark, first of all, you know, this is um, something that we haven't heard him talking for a while, so I thought this would be a great opportunity to do it, since he lives um, all the way up the coast, and it's hard to sometimes get him down to Sydney. So, I thought the other thing is um, Anzac Day coming up, so why not talk about um, something that is uh, topical? And, uh, of course, um, I know a lot of people mentioned they still want to... Um, here is talk about something that is local. Uh, so we thought Mark and myself were um, sort of really heavily involved with the Cumberland and this is probably one of our um, cornerstone um, wrecks that we did initially that started the whole Sydney project, um, um, you know, South Coast uh, wreck discovery. And of course, uh, we'll see how we go for time and uh, I'll probably touch on sort of some of the photogrammetry that we've been doing on the Tankari. So, first thing we're going to do is, uh, and uh, Mark, feel free to jump in anytime. Like I said, we're going to keep this really casual, so um, everyone can ask questions later on, so don't be shy. Um, and hopefully, okay. So, um, AU1. Um, so, the way AU1 came about, um, as um, some of you are probably aware, Mark and myself, uh, Mark in particular, uh, has been heavily involved with the AU2 project in Turkey. And um, a lot of the Sydney project guys at the time, because we're doing a lot of the deep stuff locally, and uh, we're doing a lot of archaeological work uh, here in Australia. So they, and um, AU2 is uh, in 72 meters of water. So they wanted, um, you know, people that they knew, trusted uh, to do this work. So um, a lot of us got involved with that project and it was absolutely mind blowing. And this was um, back in 2007, the first time we went there. Mark, well, when was the first time you went to AU2? Yeah, so I went to Turkey in 1997 and then 1998. 
Um, and in 1998, we actually dived on the AE2 for the first time. And of course, uh, there's a famous photo of Mark uh, decked out in all the gear um, in front of the Australian Geographic magazine, which was um, sort of quite famous. And um, all open circuit gear, Samir. <clears throat> yep, that's right. Um, so obviously, um, you know, um, fast forward uh, 2010. Um, one of the people, and I'll show you the photo, um, is uh, John Foster, um, who was the brainchild of the search for the AU-1. Now, uh, sort of just to um, let you know, as we all know, the AU-1 has been found. But uh, the reason why I wanted to show you this, and I'm going to show you a really, really cool video that was taken off the actual AU-1. But the whole process of what we did uh, of going searching it's uh, not just your typical uh, Papua New Guinea sort of, you know, blue crystal clear water, um, you know, go and enjoy it. Now, I'm just going to go through the slides and tell you um, just sort of this whole experience of how it all went about because it's really an unusual type of trip and it was a lot of hard work. We really sweated our butts off over there and there's other things that were just absolutely um, incredibly painful to deal with. So, okay. Of course, flying to New Guinea from Brisbane, you get to fly over the barrier reef. I think I was glued to the window the whole time. It, it's absolutely stunning. It's uh, probably the best time. Can't say the same for um, in New Guinea interior. Um, of course, uh, this was my first time in New Guinea, so I was uh, excited just to, this is coming into Port Moresby to see, um, you know, the the blue water and the reefs. I thought this is going to be great, you know, uh, crystal clear water is going to be fantastic. So we had to catch another flight to um, arrive in Rabaul. Now, as a lot of you might know, especially all the sort of um, um, reckies out there, Rabaul was like truck lagoon back in the early 90s, late 80s for um, wreck diving. It's full of shipwrecks. Uh -huh. It had a big Japanese um, yeah, awesome. headquarters there. And um, they were all, you know, people used to go there all the time. Thanks, Jim. And, and of course, um, you also can, couldn't escape the history over there. So this is just going into Rabal Hotel and you've got all these machine, uh, machine guns on the walls. And just outside the hotel, you've got, you know, all Japanese cannons and stuff like that. So it's just history everywhere and of course you. um you've got you know all this relation that you got so it doesn't matter where you go there it's just uh, full of war history there so if you're world war ii buff uh rabal is amazing mark is holding a shell over there is it a shell or a grenade mark can't remember i don't remember that photo been taken <laughs> <laughs> that was me taking of you <laughs> looks like a um a grenade or something yeah it looks like some kind of grenade yeah so um, the other one is uh, this chandelier. Believe it or not, this is absolutely millions and millions of tiny shells. I don't know if a lot of you know that travel specifically in the Pacific, uh, shell, uh, shell money is actually still a currency over there, believe it or not. And in New Guinea, um, you can still actually use shell money. And what you see there is literally tiny know. little shells, round shells, and this is actually shell money. But this chandelier would be worth absolutely a fortune over there. <laughs> so uh, we arrive in Raval Hotel. As you can see, it's not exactly uh, your five-star accommodation or anything flash, you know. And um, now, I don't know how many of you have been to Raval before the um, volcano eruption in '95. They used to call it the jewel of the Pacific. It was basically, they used to have expats, used to have gardening competitions, you know, who's got the best front yard. And it was absolutely one of the most beautiful towns in the, um, in the South Pacific. Of course, uh, that volcano in the background over there, this is what we were working up to every single morning. And um, when you arrive and you see that, you go, holy crap, there, there's a volca active volcano right next to your hotel. And um, first day, it's, yeah, interesting. Second day, it's like, wow, you know, it's absolutely blowing its ass off and um, it's um, going crazy. And then Mark taking this really amazing um, sort of time delay photos. It was sort of darker, um, the um, 
conditions are darker, like it's uh, showing a bit lighter, but it's actually was pretty pitch black at that stage. And Mark, what exposure did you use there for these photos? Do you remember? What, what ISO? Yeah, or sort of exposure. Was that like a oh, minute exposure? Yeah, it would have been um, probably a few seconds exposure. Oh, okay. Um, oh, sensitive film, probably uh, 200 ISO, something like that, yeah. Yeah, and they, they are film photos, so this is not digital. So Mark is still shooting digital at that stage. And uh, if you see the little structures on sort of towards the bottom on, on where the water is, that used to be the old uh, Rabal airport. So that's all, all that's left of that airport. So this is the original airstrip. To fly to Rabal, you have to go to, um, uh, K K K K I always forget how to uh, say the name, Kokopo, 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 I don't know, one of those towns. So um, it, and it's sort of a bit um, bad because if that volcano is blowing uh, towards uh, the, uh, the that town, um, it will, um, you cannot fly. So you have to be very unlucky not to. And of course, um, photos like this. So, and when you're standing over there, some of the rocks, I mean, we're standing a fair distance from the volcano, but um, the there's rocks are flying out of there the size of houses that are just glowing red. So it's really it's spectacular. And when you can hear the trembling. We've had um, one massive explosion the last night we were there. I jumped out of my bed. I thought uh, the roof collapsed. It was that loud. And of course, so the um, Rabal Harbour itself is one big uh, caldera. So that is the main volcano. Of course, the uh, magma chamber is about four kilometers um, um, under the harbour. So it's still, it's obviously um, dormant. It's not uh, extinct, it's dormant, but it hasn't exploded in the last 2000, I think it's about 2000 years. Um, this one here is called Vulcan. And this here is the opposite side of the harbor. And I should have um, a wide picture later on, I can show you. So this is called, uh, sorry, th this is called Vulcan. And the other one that's active is called um, uh, Tavaru, yeah, Tavaru, yeah, and um, so they are the two bands for the main caldera. If these two bands uh, do not blow, uh, or like the other one is constantly bending, like it's constantly erupting, um, it releases a pressure from the main caldera in the harbor. So you literally, the whole place is one huge volcano. And uh, they said uh, the last time it was erupted um, violently about probably around 4,000 years ago, Europe uh, was blanketed for about a month uh, with no sunlight. So and of it, course, um, can, sorry, I, can I jump in? Yeah. Um, just to put people in context, so why we're over here is that um, we're looking for AE-1, the other sister submarine of, uh, we had two in World War One. We had AE-1 and AE-2. Um, and AE-2 was lost in Turkey. When I say lost, it was scuttled, so all the crew got off. But um, even before that uh, campaign in Turkey, uh, AE-1 and AE-2 were in New Guinea doing exercises and uh, AE-1 was mysteriously lost. So all hands uh, lost with the submarine. It was just never seen. No one ever knew what had happened to it. So Samir and I are over there um, on the request of a, an ex-Navy guy, uh, John Foster, who Samir will introduce you to later, and um, we're following up a lead from um, a, a, an expat, Australian expat commercial diver who told us, in fact, he told me a long time before this trip that he had found a one. And uh, we, I never really, well, I was very skeptical at the time, but, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's difficult mounting an expedition like this on your own, but John Foster managed to get television support and so Samir and I had a free trip <laughs> over there. So that's giving you a bit of the background. Okay, so carry on, Samir. Yeah. Yep, and um, now um, one of the things uh, we had to sacrifice is about six months of diving because our gear all had to go by ship to oh, yeah. um, New Guinea. So three months there, three months back, it was painful waiting for your rebreather and all your gear to arrive back. Um, 
and uh, we'll talk about George Tyres, which is the salvager that Mark was talking about, because there was quite a few funny little um, stories uh, he told us. So uh, going back to uh, Raval, as you can see, this is like a, a normal street, and they're all like this, basically covered in ash. This is not dirt, this is all ash. Wherever you go, there's just ash everywhere. Of course, we had the higher cars that we traveled in, Every morning, this is what you woke up to, just a layer of ash. And you know what? I don't know if anyone's experienced ash falling on their head. It just feels like um, it, someone's just throwing sand on your head. And it's just all snowing or something like that. It's just constant to a point where you, it can be so bad where you get out of your hotel room just to go next door to the restaurant and you literally need like an umbrella or something or just run as if it's raining. And this is like the entrance to the hotel. It's like, um, welcome to Rabal Hotel. And you're like, what the hell? It's like someone forgot to sweep the streets here. And <laughs> notice something, look at the white fence. Everything there rusts. So cars only last for about 12 months because the acid in the, um, um, in the ash uh, mixes with um, with the uh, rainwater and it just rusts everything and you can set your clock over there at what time it used to rain literally at about 5 p.m it used to rain and stop at about 5 25. you can literally just say like yep i'm getting ready for the rain so uh, again uh, you go look around you know you've got all the coconut trees lost you samir oh can we hear me now Okay, so yeah, so I was just saying um, this um, over here is not just a hill. It's actually just a mound of ash. So um, all these trees, uh, you know, quite tall, but half of them completely buried in ash. It's, it's such a miserable place to be in. Uh, like, uh, it's amazing that, you know, people that stay there are really hardcore people to live in this environment because it's just relentless. You literally lose the novelty of that volcano after literally a few days. And of course, um, life goes on. As you can see in the air, it's all very dusty. So that's all the ash. You know, people, that's the market over there. That's about it. That's the main street. That's pretty much Raval. And of course, uh, we, the machetes were on Easter special. Um, and this kid here, and we'll um, show you some little kids. So the kids over there are really funny. I saw this kid, he had a Bulldogs jersey. And uh, so I, he's my boy, come over there. And we've taken him with us on the boat. We you know, um, get them to carry equipment just to keep them busy. And he said to us at the end, I like you guys. That's why I don't steal from you. I'm like, great, thank you. The only place is um, uh, Kokopo, is, uh, I just remembered how to say it. So it's actually a resort on this end and there's a, a, um, a dive center there. And we'll come back um, about this dive center, the reason why I'm mentioning it, because um, it was a little argy-bargy that happened later on uh, uh, in the trip. But uh, this is like, since it was like an escape from Rabal. It's only uh, on the other side of the bay uh, and you just got nice sandy beaches and there's no ash except if the winds turn towards it, then the airport gets closed. So you sort of like, oh, hope it doesn't do it when we're flying out. So we use the Barbarian, um, Rod, who owns this boat, and it's literally a floating shipwreck. Not because it looks like a one, but because it's built literally from shipwrecks. See those two portholes on the top? They're actually from the shipwrecks from the harbor. He literally uh, built half of this boat using parts from shipwrecks. So I used to call it the floating shipwreck. <laughs> Comfortable boat and uh, slow and all that for what it is, but uh, you wouldn't want to stay there for too long. <laughs> like a lot of these uh, skippers in remote places like New Guinea, uh, this guy, Rod, Rodney Pierce, I think his name is Pierce, Rodney Pierce, he's got quite a a reputation that precedes him <laughs> so being a bit of a wild man over there. I think they all turn a bit wild, but uh, he, he was good. He was a good host. Um, and that, you know, when you hear so much about people, you, you, you're kind of a bit worried about how they're going to behave, but uh, he was good. Um, definitely an interesting character. 
And um, so this wharf there, um, it's actually quite new. So um, the, all the wood planking, you know, when we arrived, it's actually um, it was nice and clean and all that until um, uh, the day that the volcano decided to turn towards the harbor. So um, everyday people, that's all they do over there. It's like you just sometimes look at him, you think, is anyone work around this place? But that's pretty much the normal sort of regular um, uh, thing that you see. The kids are super cute over there. Um, you know, they're obviously very curious. Um, all just come up and look at you and it's like, who is this white people? And, uh, oops, I think I might have just kicked one by accident. Oh, no. Okay, so I'm down the bottom there. Um, um, we've got the... Um, so, yeah, so all the kids are just swimming in, in, that, uh, in the harbor. Um, it's just every day. That's all it is. So this across the, the bay uh, where the cruise ships uh, come in, there is, um, uh, this is an Australian uh, survey ship. Um, we'll come back to this one. I know, Tom, you are thinking to yourself, um, which one is it? Which one is it? I don't remember the name of it. Uh, hold on. Let me unmute you. Where, where are you? I just lost you. Where did you go? You're at Melville. HMS Melville. Oh, okay. 246. Okay, cool. Thank you. Old ship. <laughs> did you look that one up, Tom? Did you? Pardon? Did you look that one up, did you? No, that was my old ship. I was on that. Oh, oh. Year and a half. <laughs> right. Okay, perfect. Oh, what a there good you go. <laughs> So um, the reason why I put it on there, because um, at some stage um, we've actually um, asked, because um, they were there and they had every survey gear and we thought, here we are looking for a submarine. I mean, what a better way than just, you know, actually ask a ship that's got um, every conceivable uh, piece of equipment for surveying, you know, can have a look for us. But... Not every ship, everything is lucky. I mean, this is the, the harbor. Look at the amount of ash. And um, also note how the, um, the reason I'm showing you this is, note how the ash is sort of built up uh, right over the water. Now, one of the things that um, John Foster, when um, he's looking at the different locations where the AU-2 might be, we had maps post-95 eruption and um, maps that are pre-95 eruption. And the reason why is because the shoreline of the whole harbor changed by about 150 meters. So um, where there used to be water is now land. It's literally the land um, came in around by 150 meters. So, and the harbor is, is got very steep walls. So um, it drops off on the sides very, very quickly. So um, you could be within, you know, 10 meters of the shore and you could be down, you know, 50, 60 meters of water. So that is significant, the fact that the shoreline changed that much because if there's any shipwrecks that were moored or sank anywhere near the shoreline in that sort of water, they would be completely buried. And that's one of the things we wanted to make sure that when we're searching for something is we knew exactly what sort of uh, proximity we were from the shore. So the, uh, the guys over here, so um, the late John Foster um, uh, is on the far right over here. John Foster, um, Tom, you'll be interested as well, is used to be captain of uh, HMAS Canberra, um, an ex, uh, sorry, HMAS Victoria, I think it is, the ex-aircraft uh, carrier that Australia had. Oh, oh Melbourne, sorry, you're yes, right. You. Melbourne, yes, yes. You see, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so... Um, um, so he was, I mean, obviously a true and true um, Navy guy and absolutely one of the nicest human beings you would have met. Mm. Sadly, he passed away uh, the, the following year. He did manage to do one more trip here, but he passed away not long after. The guy in the middle there in the white t-shirt is, um, all we knew him as Major Tom. He's an ex-SAS guy, um, extremely knowledgeable in history, and he uh, was there um, acting as a historian. Um, that's helping John. And then you've got Rod there um, in without a shirt. And of course, you've got George Tyers, um, the old um, guy with the um, cane there. So he was a salvager. 
Now, um, George is a funny, funny character. He's uh, lived in uh, Rabaul and around New Guinea for a very long time, back in the um, sort of 70s and even 60s, I think. And they did a lot of salvaging, like literally go down, put a bunch of charges and blow the crap out of the wreck and just bring up as much um, metal as possible. And um, of course, George was adamant that uh, in about 90 meters of water uh, that he uh, dropped down on a single tank back in the, I don't know, 70s or something. And he uh, could swim that um, after the couple of bottles of rum that he had on the, before the dive, that he saw the AU-1 and he's absolutely sure it was the AU-1. When the fact that the two bottles of rum, rum were mentioned, um, we all were rather skeptical about that. But, uh, you know, you look at any opportunity. The young crew over there uh, that's sitting with Major Tom and his wife, um, and um, they were fantastic. And of course, uh, as Mark mentioned, um, this is sponsored by Channel 7. We were there um, uh, filming for um, Sunday night and Mike Monroe was um, with us over there. And I'll tell you what, uh, it, like I work in broadcasting and television and um, there are so many um, uh, drama queens and so many people with egos. He is seriously probably the only person that I'm um, uh, in television that was just absolutely down to earth was absolutely interested in everything we did and the whole history. And it was literally, it was a pleasure just uh, being around with the guys there. So um, yeah, absolutely the nicest person if you ever get to meet him. So the um, interesting part. So as you uh, mentioned before, took three months for a gear to arrive by ship because we had a lot of stuff being shipped over there. So they had to go by ship. So this is X uh, Yacht Club. They used to be, which used to be very, very popular with all the expats over there. It was very trendy sort of place. Now it's a bit of um, a hole, literally. <laughs> There's nothing there. So when we arrived over there, we obviously weren't going to take um, uh, cylinders and stuff with us. So they said, yep, no problem. We're going to um, source the local cylinders for stages. It was only Mark and myself who were diving. So we've got our rebreathers, we've got all our gear, all our camera gear. And they gave us these tanks and we thought, okay, well, they're just normal scuba tanks, um, probably about a million years old. And we literally have to go and clean them ourselves. We literally started the day with stripping them, oxygen cleaning them, literally doing a service on the tanks before even thinking about filling anything. You can see in the background there, we've got the oxygen and the helium tanks. Mark is diving his um, um, fancy uh, Mark 15.5. So he's got the Inconel spheres. And uh, Tom, I can see a nice smile on you as soon as that came up. <laughs> and of course, this is our little blending station. So um, use uh, buckets for cooling the cylinders. Um, Mark brought his um, booster pump at the time. So, and this was, and I cannot describe to you the humidity. I'm sort of smiling over there, but I'm absolutely burning alive from humidity and heat and dust and every sort of mosquito and insect uh, eating us alive while we're doing this. And everyone knows how you're supposed to compress pure oxygen in clean conditions. <clears throat> And look at it. <laughs> Especially with all that rust on the, the G sizes. Uh, rust, yeah. <laughs> and of course, you know, the um, high tech method of cooling, you know, use a bucket of water. Um, so that took us literally um, um, one full day. And we, I think we're pretty much exhausted just after this. I'm like thinking, we haven't even got on the boat yet and we're already exhausted. So that was uh, the, the first day. Um, so this is the crew, the guy on the top there that's um, pointing at Mark, um, he is uh, the, the Channel 7 producer, who um, I know he doesn't work there anymore, because Sunday night doesn't exist anymore, and the cameraman down um, the bottom there, these guys were very, very patient, extremely professional, and were just really helpful to work with. And of course, the kids. 
the, uh, we've just taken these kids with us everywhere and they are just uh, so funny and so much fun and they just want to like can we carry can we do this uh, of course they just you know everywhere we went and the yoga part i was telling you about so mark uh, they're showing off his uh, handstands and the kid is like just like oh yeah no worries <laughs> yeah it's like unbelievable. Uh, you should see them throw a footy. Like literally, I've never seen kids uh, go in there. Like I'm thinking, these guys should be playing in the NRL. Like they're just incredible. I hate being shown up by little kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this, uh, <laughs> so this structure here is called the beehives. Um, so, um, the, so basically we were searching pretty much from this structure here, and I'll show you a wide picture here so you can see where the beehives is. So from the beehives and up with the photo towards uh, the outside of the harbor is where our search area was. Next to the beehive, um, there's an awesome little, I got to do a little sneaky solo dive on a um, um, Japanese transporter that is uh, on it, on its side, um, I sort of um, begged and pleaded, can I please go and just quickly do a dog, at least on something that is big and rusty. So that was good fun. So the days literally spent doing this, looking at the chart, staring at that screen, and the rest of us are either asleep or just sitting there and enjoying the tropical weather looking at um, life passing by and just do what the locals do. But most days it was really, really boring when we're just running up and down, up and down, just scanning the areas that um, where potential targets may be. Of course, once um, a few targets um, identified, we can see lumps and something interesting. The, so we had this banana boat. Um, the guys will jump on the boat and um, just put, a, I mean, there's no currents over there. Um, and it's all quite deep water there with sort of with Mark looking at uh, between 80 to 95 meters of water uh, in all the spots we're looking at. And um, so, yeah, just a thin line, nylon line there that was sufficient. Um, and of course, um, 30, what is it, 31 degrees um, on the top or 32 degrees on the top and it was 29 degrees at about 90 meters. So um, I thought, bugger this, I'm going in board shorts. Mark is a little bit um, less silly than me, so he's got a little wetsuit over there. But um, ah, that was so good to be able to just dive in uh, in, in board shorts. You were in board shorts when we went to uh, Indonesia diving on the Perth, weren't you, Samir? Yeah, that was a bit of a mistake. <laughs> um, diving in half a meter visibility in raging current and in really oh, sharp a, metal. A rusty wreck that was breaking up on us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not much left of it now, unfortunately. That's another story. <laughs> yes. And um, so, yeah, so um, the film crew always, um, so um, we had to basically, uh, you know, look our best and perform for the cameras over there. No, not at all. We just did our thing and um, didn't really worry what the camera is doing and all that because that's the last thing we needed. So, um, basically, pretty much uh, that's the boat there. So, um, normally all our gear lived on the boat. Uh, we've taken the cylinders to fill them out, but other than that, we left on the boat. When the first couple of days, um, the ash wasn't falling where the boat was moored, but then the uh, sort of the winds turned and then the boat would be covered in the ash every single day. So we had to literally store all our gear inside the where the engine room compartment is. Otherwise, there will be nothing left for breathers or anything else um, with all the water that mixes in. So... Um, I've got, um, I was using um, just a normal, uh, my TRV 950, um, my standard definition camera. Um, you know, the footage uh, was used, like I said, for Sunday night and um, that format was still uh, used and perfectly fine. Actually, when Mark mentioned the, um, the HMS Perth, it was funny, we hired um, you know, proper HD cameras who took over there. Then the guys said to me, um, our Abbott suite, um, broke, uh, you know, the one that's supposed to do HD all broke down. So, um, you know, we can only do SD. I'm like, bugger this one. I'm taking my camera. It's so much, much better when you know your gear. So, as I said, um, diving conditions is what you dream of. Uh, you know, no current, flat always, you know, in the harbor. Um, water visibility, not 
really great. Now, it's sort of okay in the top part, but once you get to the bottom, the whole place is covered in ash. It's just um, uh, basically one big silt mound. And uh, one of the problems is, okay, we identify a mound, but how do we know if there's going to be a wreck? Because we don't know if it's, um, it's going to be a wreck underneath or not. So um, what I had, oops, there we go. So we literally uh, grabbed this um, metal pole. It was about five meters long. I stuck um, a couple of um, clips on it so I can clip it to myself. Um, and um, literally I would poke that thing all the way down until my hand literally disappears. It's like so fine. It was like a powder, this uh, particular, um, uh, all the ash down there. And trying to hit metal and never ever even gone close to anything, hitting anything that was um, hard, whether it's rock or whether it's, um, it was just nothing but absolutely mounds of this uh, really disgusting um, sort of ash. Of course, um, as you see in this photo, so now the ash is gone over the harbor. And you know, when I was saying to you, you sort of just want to get away from it uh, on a normal day. Going over the harbor on the boat, it was our escape from the ash. It was so nice not to be breathing it, falling on your head, or just have to deal with it. And then the last few days um, when we were searching, it decided to turn. When we are diving with Mark, and I'm sitting over there, and I'm looking, and like I'm just wearing, you know, um, board shorts and just a um, um, short sleeve sort of top. And I'm looking at my arms, I'm like, Oh, for God's sake, there is ash falling down from the top to the water on us. Like on Deco, we are getting ash on, on top of us. I'm thinking, you can't even get away from this crap underwater. I'm like, where else do you have to go to get away from it? It was so frustrating. It is it's a horrible thing. We're on top of the, if you, anyone's ever in Rabal, this is the, um, um, uh, what do you call it? The volcano center or whatever it's called um, on the top. So um, it's got all the uh, seismic um, activity instrumentation inside to sort of look for earthquakes and basically monitor the, um, uh, to make sure that the volcano doesn't erupt uh, majorly. Of course, we did get to see uh, some uh, rust. Now, we don't know if anyone's actually ever dived on this. Um, and uh, the reason being is this is in an, uh, probably around close to 90 meters that we're diving over there. And um, like we're not aware too many people doing any deep diving back then, but um, it's literally uh, pieces of, of of a wreck. What it is, we don't know. It's just jambled metal everywhere. And obviously it's a target that we had to check out. And that's pretty much sort of the nicest part is to be able to go and have a look and we're thinking, well, can we see anything that might resemble a submarine part? Of course, if you find things that, you know, beams and all that, you think, no, nah, that's obviously comes from a ship. Uh, it's obviously not it. But we did get across some of these uh, things. Oops, what about that? Okay. Okay, so back to the, um, the uh, sort of the uh, survey ship. Now, the survey ship here, it's actually making its way out. And one of the reasons why I was mentioning it is because so the incident that we had towards the end of the trip was that one of the guys, and Mark, I don't know if you recall his name or not, that ran the, uh, used to run the dive center in... Um, whatever it was, yeah. Yeah, Kokopo. Um, he came up and he said um, he had a video of some diver somewhere, um, or drop, no, it was a drop camera that they dropped yeah. in about... I think it was about 110, 115 meters. 110 meters, yeah. Yeah, and um, they uh, swear that it, uh, it was a submarine. And um, he was sort of got on his high horse and he was like, uh, what is it, what's it for me? You know, um, he obviously wants to fame and glory. And we said, that is fine. Like even all the um, network guys and everyone said, you got one glory, not a problem. You can be the fine day, we can give you all that, just tell us where it is, because Mark and myself, ready to go to do that depth, we're the only ones capable over there to do it. Just, you know, let us just have a look, quick drop, and we can have a look, we confirm whether it's a submarine or not. And of course, that uh, sort of got in all a little bit ugly, and there was money demanded, and all sort of fell in a heap. 
John Foster contacted his contacts in the Navy and he said, look, the ship is right there. It's just about to sail out of the harbor. Can you guys uh, just run a uh, multi-beam over this particular site and a few other sites that we're looking at and just give us a sort of a wider picture? Unfortunately, they turned us down. But as we all know, uh, and especially the, all of you guys that's been to Austec and all that, the AU-1 was found um, in 20, late 2018. The uh, petrol, which is uh, owned by the late uh, Paul Allen, um, they did a full ROV survey. I'm going to show you a video that I've stolen um, from um, some website. Um, and uh, it's got the basically um, uh, fantastic footage of this. Let me just play it. I'm not sure there's any music, any talking, but there is. Um, um, okay, we can talk over it while it's. Um, uh, it's they, they'll basically put text on what we're looking at. So we're just comparing it, Mark, I suppose, to the AU2. Um, AU2 is um, quite intact compared to this one here. And uh, what we don't see on the AU2 is, um, as you see here, is you see the propellers nice and exposed. On the AU2, you can only see just the top of the blade. So uh, he's not giving it a colos uh, um, colonoscopy. He's just looking at the, um, the rear torpedo chip. And the ubiquitous conga eel. <laughs> yes. What is it with conga eels and submarines? Um, AE2 in Turkey had conga eels too. Right in the conning tower. Yeah. And I remember I had to um, get a sample of the oil that was trapped underneath the uh, the hatch, and I had to put my hand inside the, um, that um, conning tower thinking, oh, there's a conga eel in there. That's a bit creepy, yeah. Um, the, the difference, Beck, uh, Samir and I are saying how wonderful it would be to be diving on a wreck in this type of clarity and stillness of water, if only it wasn't so deep. Um, AE2 was in uh, 72 metres depth, but visibility, I think it was a bit better for Samir's trip, but in my earlier trips, um, the best I had was about five metres visibility. Yeah, I think uh, we've had about that. And then uh, once work commenced, uh, we've had about half a metre, sometimes 30 centimetres maybe. Yeah. But uh, obviously uh, the AU2 is very, very intact. Like what you see here, a lot of like these wheels and everything else. So they, um, they managed to put in, um, well, they, they've broken the hatch off and uh, put a mini ROV inside the AU2. So you can see all this um, steering bloody fish always in the way um you can see all this steering mechanism and all that on the au2 inside the, its conning tower and stuff but here because it's um um so exposed and so damaged you can see all these things quite clearly this thing is um they don't say tell us exactly how deep it is but i believe it's in about 270 or 200 something meters i thought it was in excess of 300 samir no, it's actually a little bit shallower than that. They're not saying oh, it's, actually, it's divable. <laughs> if you look at what Craig and Harry, you know, and Harry is doing in peace, yeah. 45, it's uh, getting there. <laughs> yeah, they won't tell us where it is though. Um, but um, you'll see. Uh, you'll see shortly. They do a, like a quick fly over the wreck. It's actually quite amazing. And then you see the ROV that they used. And the funny thing was the guys that um, went there, actually the, um, the AU2 Foundation, they um, were involved um, with AU, AU1 over there to do the survey when they did with, the, um, with Paul Allen. And um, what they um, said was, when you look at the, have a look at the ROV at the end and note the little camera in the middle they've got this really massive fancy multi-million dollar gear on that rov and the huge camera but they used a uh, gopro to do a photogrammetry <laughs> which was quite funny
So what they, so you can see the implosion there from when it um, went down. So what they think might have happened is uh, the same as um, AU2, and if you look at the uh, reports, both of these submarines were brought to Australia um, before World War I uh, from England, and it was at the time world record for the longest journey by any submarines uh, to cross uh, from one port to another. And um, they were quite primitive machines. To control them were very, very difficult. They had really horrible sort of controls, um, the way they dived and you had to be, um, uh, like literally it was uh, sometimes just luck to try and control these things. And one of the problems was is once it goes into, um, into sort of um, a managed dive, it was really hard for it to recover. And they think that's what happened, that it just dived and they couldn't gain control of it. So here's a flyover, which looks pretty cool. So um, just a little bit of the uh, petrol. I mean, this is just a dream to have a survey ship like this. Hmm. And just check out the size of that ROV that they used. And I'm just looking, yeah, it's outside the harbor, <laughs> just in the background where it might be. It's just a small ROV, but look, have a look at that green camera. That's a GoPro. So it's pretty close to shore there. So just to um, show you like how deep the water is around there, like you literally can be, uh, there's a beach where we did a little tour and uh, to have a look at the uh, Japanese tunnels and there's an underwater tunnel where the submarines used to come in and uh, dock underwater. And you're literally standing uh, like l right on the water's edge and it's just a wall drops down straight down to about, I think it's about 80 meters, just straight down. I mean, look at that control room. So um, the rear Admiral Briggs that was there in the background, he was involved with the AU-2. So that's it for the AU-1. Okay, so coming back locally now. So, um, yes, Tom. That's all right. I was just showing you pictures of the tunnels. Right. Uh, tunnel. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Are you yes, doing that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the Cumberland, so the Cumberland was um, something uh, always going to be special for us because um, this is basically the wreck that started um, everything that all the exploration that we did on the south coast. And um, in 2003, we got a call from Tim Smith from the Heritage Office um, and said, hey, you the guys who have been sort of diving the peak and practicing there, um, you know, anticipating to dive and explore a deep wreck, I might have a target for you. So in 2001, and actually 2000, CSIRO were running surveys down um, on Victorian New South Wales border, scanning the ocean, um, you know, as they do, and they've come across this anomaly which looked like a shipwreck. And they um, took them about three years before they crunched all the data and they came across it, and they obviously gave that information to Tim Smith. So Tim um, gets in touch with us and he says, can you guys go and have a look? We thought, uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we thought, okay, excellent. So um, we didn't know how sort of deep it's going to be or whatever. So it was all a bit of an exploration. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over for a little while here to Mark first to um, uh, speak to you just a little bit about the history of the Cumberland because it's uh, really fascinating and it uh, involves also um, um, people that done surveys on other famous shipwrecks that's been dived in Europe and New in New Zealand. And Mark has had a lot of um, contact with those people that were actually involved in over there. So Mark, over to you. All right, Samir. Uh, thanks everyone. So uh, this was probably Sydney Project's biggest uh, initial project. And um, I was just going through recently 
two big folders of information that we were gathering over time. And it just made me realize how much work Samir went into preparing for this trip. Um, talking about the dive logistics, uh, the, the wreck was down just under 100 meters deep and we wanted to do it safely. It was off a pretty wild part of the uh, Australian coast down there near Eden. Um, and as you know, quite different to diving in uh, inside Rabaul Harbour. <laughs> um, and uh, anyway, we, we went down there to uh, look at this wreck, which was suspected to be the Cumberland. Now, why it was significant, uh, two reasons historically. One is it's a reminder that World War I came very close to our shores in 1917. Uh, there was a German raider uh, disguised as a normal passenger, a normal uh, cargo ship, and uh, it was cruising up and down the south coast of New South Wales and into Victoria. And um, the, the, the Wolf, the, this, is, this was the, uh, the Wolf, W-O-L-F, uh, it was a German raider, and uh, on board there were a whole lot of uh, uh, people uh, that were taken off ships. There was one New Zealander called Alexander Roy, um, and they were all captives aboard. And they and Alexander Roy later wrote a book about his experiences being a prisoner on on this wharf, and how he could remember off this part of Australia. They you know the mines rolling off the deck into the water. Um, so I think there might have been twenty or so mines that were dropped off. Um, that part of the coast. Unfortunately, the Cumberland, a, a British cargo ship um, heading back home down to the south side of Australia, it had hit one of these mines. Um, now, it didn't immediately sink. They had time, in fact, to get the uh, crew off the ship and they, and the, they managed to uh, bring the ship up to Gabo Island, right at the, uh, I think, just south of the border. And at Gabo Island, it was basically uh, in shallow water there. Um, they effected repairs to the best they could. They patched it up and then towed the big ship back up to, it was going back up to Eden. And on the way, uh, the winds blew from an uh, unfavorable direction and the ship took on water and sank. So uh, no lives lost to my knowledge. Uh, that's correct, Samir, I think, isn't it? Correct, yes, yep. And um, uh, it sank. Uh, now, that, that I think is, is historical enough because it was a victim of uh, an enemy ship off our shores in World War I. Most people don't know that. We know we had Japanese ships uh, and, and maybe German in World War II lurking uh, in the um, Southern Hemisphere, but, but this was the first to my knowledge of any, um, any awareness that World War I was so close to our shore. Now, the ship just sat there forgotten for many years, but it was carrying, um, well, cargo that you wouldn't consider to be that expensive, that valuable, uh, but there were lots and lots of copper, lead and zinc ingots and uh, enough of that to warrant a salvage. So there was a British cargo ship uh, run by a company called Risden Beasley, and they had a, uh, one of their ships was called Foremost 17. So if you advance a little bit, Samir. So on board that uh, Foremost 17, this is back in 19, so we're advancing years now, 1951, 1952, uh, Foremost 17 came to recover uh, a lot of those ingots. <clears throat> and this is at a 100 metre deep wreck. And this is a guy called Alan Martin, and he was one of the deckhands. And that middle shot is him at 20 years of age in 1951. Um, and he's down there, probably somewhere near Wollongong, and working on the Foremost 17. Now, after our work diving on the uh, ship, I caught up with Alan Martin and he showed me all his old photos. So I managed to photograph his photographs um, and I discovered that, that they used a, what's called an observation chamber. And here's a picture of one on the left. 
and, it's, and it was made in Italy, so it's called a Galeazzi chamber. And that, that illustration in the right there is just to give you a bit of an idea of uh, how, they, how they work. Um, a diver uh, is lowered down in, in a one atmosphere environment, so they're just enjoying the same air pressure we are now. Um, inside that observation chamber, which you hope never develops any leaks, uh, is uh, a, a couple of, usually a couple of oxygen tanks. And uh, at least in the case of Foremost 17 or the Galeazzi chamber, the diver inside will just turn on the valve of the oxygen tank every now and again just to uh, revitalize the air. Um, now, you wonder about the CO2. They had the option of wearing on, on their chest, and I think there's a picture coming up. Yeah, this is John O. Johnston. He was an Australian diver that was involved in the recovery of gold ingots from uh, the Niagara in New Zealand. And um, uh, they used the chamber as well. And this is back more than 10 years earlier than that. This is back in about 1940. And John O. Johnston there has a, um, a, a mask that he can put on his mouth if he so desired. And all that happened there was that expired air went through a little uh, CO2 scrubber. So that's how they managed the carbon dioxide. But Alan Martin reckoned that the diver didn't wear that mask. Um, I'm a bit dubious of that. I'm sure they must have had a mask inside there because, uh, um, you know, why risk it? Um, but as I understand it, they're only in the chamber for about 20 minutes at a time. Uh, the chamber was lowered down onto the Cumberland. The, uh, this is the foremost 17 in dry dock. Um, the diver in the chamber had a telephone communication to the surface and he would say, okay, uh, bring your explosives. They'd lower explosives down to the wreck and uh, they'd lay it out in a certain part under the direction of the diver. They would then, I presume, pull the diver out, um, hence the 20 minutes, probably let the explosives go and then bring the diver down and the diver would then direct the um, working of a big grab. And there's a chain, there's that observation chamber, the Galeazzi chamber. I think it looks like it's being brought out of the water, isn't it? You can see by the water yes. yep. dropping off the top. Um, and <clears throat> on the right here, you can see that big grab and you can see some ingots. The ingots are the little uh, sort of uh, indented bits. Um, they're copper and the, probably the straight ones are lead ingots. Um, and that's what they would typically pull out with it. Now that grab, Alan described it as a, a mat grab. It could carry, it could pull up five tons of material in one hold. So um, that's what they did. They just gradually pulled up bits of wreckage until they got 95% of the ingots. And uh, just to cut that story short, they then went over to New Zealand and uh, followed up on the work of uh, John O. Johnston 10 years earlier. Uh, they, John O. Johnston recovered uh, most of the ingots, but left about 30 down there, or a bit more than 30. Uh, Foremost 17 recovered 30 gold ingots <laughs> after this trip. So financially, it was worth their while. Even in the copper and lead ingots they got on the Cumberland, I think it was equivalent to um, about a million, million and a half dollars in today's currency. So it's quite, a, quite an incredible salvage story, I thought, if you're interested in diving history and, um, you know, that was happening off our coast too. And uh, until we learned about the Cumberland, that was uh, unknown history. And um, the... If anyone interested, the two books, uh, I know it's probably showing in reverse there, uh, The Cruise of the Raider Wolf by Roy Alexander. And then there's another one, and I'm not sure how rare these copies are. I was lucky to find this, Raider Wolf. This is by Edwin Hoyt, the actual captain of the uh, Raider Wolf that um, wrote this book. So these two are really uh, fascinating reads. And this is, uh, uh, what's the name? Um, oh. Roy Alexander, that New Zealand guy I was talking about, <clears throat> he wrote a book on the cruise of the Raider Wolf as well. So that's a good book to get if, if you want to look into the history. And Roy Alexander turned out to be the uncle of a 
a specialist dentist colleague of mine. <laughs> so he had some personal, he had some pictures of Roy Alexander too. So coming into the diving, so um, fast forward 2013, um, and we're um, doing our first trip over there. Um, like I said, uh, this was um, really exciting for us because at that particular point, um, we were doing um, a, quite a few dives on the peak of Sydney, um, just you know, building our methods, um, building, uh, testing decompression stations, um, because at the time, uh, you know, not too many people have done this type of dives, especially in a group. So we had to work out a lot of things. And this is, um, was all very exciting to, to actually do it on the shipwreck finally. The water that day was um, absolutely freezing. I think it was like about um, 12 degrees on the top and something like 9 degrees on the bottom. And they had this huge jellyfish. You know those jellyfish, they're probably about a couple of meters in diameter and they've got literally millions of tentacles that are like, you know, five, 10 meters long. And they were just everywhere. It made a really interesting deco. <laughs> um, so when we go down and um, obviously we envisage, okay, the Cumberland was 144 meters long. So it was, it, it is now the officially the largest shipwreck in New South Wales after we dive there. And um, we thought, okay, we're going to see a really big shipwreck down there. On the initial dive, we um, landed, it was uh, Paul Garski there. You can see Paul with that sort of silver box on his back. That's his twin inspiration. I used to call it the fridge because he used to give me a hernia pulling it out mm -hmm. of the car. Um, and um, the um, when we it was Simon Mitchell, Paul, and myself, we dropped down, and uh, when we dropped, we just looked, and it was jumble of metal. It was literally just not even big pieces like you see over here, and we are on around the bridge here, and we literally looked which direction do we go because it couldn't make um, sense of where we were, and it was just amazing the amount of destruction we're down there. And as you can see here, oops, go back. Uh, well, slow down. Okay, so um, like here on the bridge, and you can see the amount of damage there is. And the reason being is when they did the salvage, they literally um, would, like Michael will explain, they would put down the chamber, the uh, opera, the diver inside the chamber would get the grab to put the charges down in specific place. They'll pull up the chamber up to the ship and blow the crap out of it. And literally, they just repeated and repeated this until they've got uh, all of the ingots that they needed. And um, what they've done is the grab would pull up the stuff from a specific area, and then they will get all the ingots, and then they will just drop all the metal back next to the ship. So that debris field that we landed was literally where all the mangled metal they would drop. So. It's sort of weird, you normally go down on the shipwreck and you're like, oh yeah, I sort of can navigate my way back here without running a line. Over there, you literally wouldn't have a clue which way is a shot line if you don't run the line. You've got to have um, a line that you got to run from the shot line. Otherwise, unless you're like at the stern, run right at the stern because that's a spectacular part of the wreck, which is this one here. So uh, Mark taking this uh, really amazing shot. He's got two giant propellers. Um, Mark, um, I'll let you explain the visibility and the conditions on that particular dive because I know you've been recently talking about it. Yeah. Um, now, that was 2007, 2008, 2000? Yeah. Yeah, about 2000. Yeah, around 2007, correct. Yeah, around 2007. Um, yeah, so this was one of our later dives on the Cumberland. Uh, we had dived it in mostly in... Uh, Oh, pretty average visibility um, and as Samir said every dive was you know not quite sure where you are on the wreck and what does it look like <laughs> and uh, on this particular dive we dive down in blue water well that's okay we, we do that plenty of times and then it gets murky as you get to the bottom but then all of a sudden we're getting down and you can see a huge part of the wreck um, uh, all in blue water and clearly well in excess of uh, 50 meters. 
And um, so, you know, way, way at more than 100, 100 foot visibility. And all to the bottom. Um, it was a bit cold down there. I don't remember the temperature, Samir, but I think it was still a bit cool. Yeah, I mean, we're there in the winter time as we mostly do all these trips down there. And um, being sort of uh, awesome. further south, it was uh, probably around 11, 10 degrees on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, that'd be about right. And um, anyway, uh, it was just magnificent because the stern of the ship is the largest part of the ship still intact um, to this day. So it was the, the dive that gave us an appreciation of what, uh, the Cumberland looked like, at least from behind. And um, and that's in those conditions and just happening to have dropped our drop line in that part of the wreck, as, as Samir said, it's a fairly big wreck. Um, I think this makes this a pretty rare photo, Samir, um, of something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've been lucky, um, and uh, the guys, Tom, uh, and the guys, especially the last uh, trip that we did to uh, the William Doors, um, we have encountered conditions like this um, on a few occasions uh, down the south coast, uh, which is quite remarkable, especially in the last trip that we did. There was conditions was, well, not the last the one, before one. <laughs> last one was horrible. But um, one of the interesting things here is, now, um, uh, Fritz uh, is probably, I don't know, 50 meters away from Mark here. But what is significant about this particular location you can just faintly make out the stern in the back there. So when we used to dive this wreck in darker conditions, I mean, the um, um, problem is you get a lot of nutrients around there um, and um, you get literally pitch black conditions. And it took us a few dives to work out. Um, every time we would go from where the bridge is and we knew where the bow is because I'll show you the next photo what we found on it. So we knew which part it was the bow and we knew where the bridge is because we can see the boilers and all that, but there's suddenly a, a wreck just disappears and we couldn't make any sense. Like what the hell happened? Like where's the rest of it? We knew it didn't break up in two when it sank. Um, so what was going on? So later on, when we had conditions uh, this clear, um, we sort of realized that the amount of material that the salvage removed was basically um, just left nothing on the, over there. It's like literally just the ribs of the of the hull and nothing else. So when you're diving in dark conditions, the shipwreck just disappears. But when you get clear conditions, you're suddenly like, oh wow, okay, I can make out something in the background there. But uh, we um, sort of uh, had to uh, go out and sound the um, different parts of the wreck. So we sounded the stern and we said on next dive let's just go and target on that particular day just the stern so you need a scooter if you're going to dive this wreck you definitely need a scooter if you want to see it from bow to stern swimming it is a long way it might be 144 meters but because it's now spread out in such a large area because of just debris everywhere it's actually a lot further so swimming it at uh, 98 meters um, is just not an option for that long distance. You just uh, run out of time and um, it's dangerous to, to literally swim flat out of that depth. So one of the things we, um, uh, we were lucky on that first trip, the first two days. So on the first dive with Simon and with Paul, um, when we uh, ended up, um, uh, Simon navigated and we sort of ended up towards the bow, we found the, uh, these letters, the MUE. Um, we haven't been back there and, and um, this is the first and the last time I've been around the, the bow of the wreck. So we haven't searched for any other letters around there if they exist, but this was sort of like, okay, um, well, that's pretty much definitive that it's the Cumberland. And then the other part is these bones. They're not human bones because no one lost their lives. The Cumberland was carrying also a cargo of frozen uh, meat to Europe. So it was going to England. Um, and was going to obviously to supply all the um, uh, armies over there. So it had a lot of beef uh, on board. And that was another definitive thing that, um, oh yeah, okay. Well, we know there's letting gods, which were the, we found quite a few around there. 
uh, not lead, sorry, copper, um, the bones and the letters, and of course, um, you know, the shape of it and the length. So we knew 100% that it was a Cumberland. And I saw a couple of ingots too, but I never photographed them. Yeah, they are around there, and that's one of the things we really need to do. I'm going to sh just play a quick video. It's only about a minute and a half, just to show you what the ship looks down there. That's all good music. Well, interwebs are not uh, cooperating. Come on. Try backing it up, so maybe it'll catch up. Actually, with us. hold on. I've got another. I've got a, a backup plan. Just bear me one second, guys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually play the video from. I'm just going to. I'm just going to play it uh, directly from my computer because I think it's just going to be struggling. And I've got no idea where I saved it. I think I might have deleted from where it is. What happened to that rebreather? <laughs> I will come to that in uh, just a second. Oh, okay. Oh, is that uh, Harry's? Oh, no, no. No, 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 no. This is my rebreather, Mark. Oh. That's exactly how it looks. And I think we have to put up, unfortunately, with this video. Let me just try it again. Hopefully, it doesn't have a heart attack. be horrible so this is Simon Mitchell so I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit this might be uh, okay I don't know what's going on with this video so this is Simon Mitchell basically swimming towards the bow okay you know what ain't happening okay don't know what's going on Okay, well, let's go to the uh, sort of more interesting part, photogrammetry. So, um, fast forward, um, you know, another 10 or 15 years, and everyone is uh, basically uh, going crazy with photogrammetry. I don't know if um, any of you have seen uh, Pete Measley's little um, presentation. Tom, why are you taking a photo of me? Um, <laughs> Um, the, so if anyone's seen Pete Measley's little presentation this morning that he did with Becky, um, um, they talked about um, the photogrammetry uh, stuff that he's been doing with Marcus in uh, Truck Lagoon. Absolutely incredible stuff. Um, one of the things uh, it's great for them is they're using SLRs, clear water, um, shallow wrecks, plenty of time, scooters, uh, you know, uh, strobes. And the results are getting are just incredible. Like Operation Baseline, if you guys want to have a look online, um, just find that. So for us, what we want to do is we want, basically want to take um, the photogrammetry and actually bring these uh, shipwrecks to life, not only with 3D, but also, also with virtual reality. As you can see, the uh, original tools that was used, and this is the Karajong here in, um, in, of Bradley's head in Sydney um, that you see there. It's a multi-beam sonar scan. Now, it's great to see that, but you can see there's no detail whatsoever. This is one of the wrecks uh, we are trying to do photogrammetry if the visibility just goes above half a meter um, in the harbor sometimes. It's really, really challenging. We're gonna try. We're going to really, really try and do this um, um, scan of this wreck somehow. Even um, if there's a couple of meters of visibility, we're going to, it's going to take us forever, but um, it's, uh, we're going to try. But we want to create more and more detailed stuff. Again, this is another um, multi-beam sonar um, of the Oak. But a photogrammetry has been done of this, and um, you see incredible amount of detail on this. So we really want, and mind you, this is lying in extremely dirty water in Scotland. So you've got absolutely no chance ever to see this wrecking like this. So 
any kind of mapping of shipwrecks um, will bring them to life. It will literally um, give you a complete overview of what the shipwreck looks. And one a good point Peter um, sort of mentioned this morning when I was looking at his presentation. And so they've been scanning things even like engine rooms inside those wrecks and all that. And that is great, but um, not everyone's going to want to uh, go to a wreck and know where everything else is because to them it's an exploration they want to explore where things are but if you are a photographer for example and you're going down into a really deep wreck or any wrecks on the south coast that we're talking about wrecks in 140 meters and 125 meters you've got bugger all time down there and uh, you really just want to utilize as much time as you can um, to look at the interesting parts for example like the uh, royal oak over here the William Dawes is a 140 meter long Liberty ship, broken um, stern, and the Hamain hull is upside down. Absolutely boring as batshit if you're going to swim on the up upside down hull because there's nothing to see. All the interesting parts is where the entry points into the wreck. But if you are swimming and you don't have a scooter and you want to be where the interesting parts are, if you've got an idea of an image, something like this, and you can see, okay, I want to target that particular hole so I can go inside and look at all the jeeps and trucks that are inside, you can plan your dive at least to give you a better chance um, of seeing something like that because it's a lot of effort, a lot of money, a lot of time to go down there not to be able to see what you would like to see. And plus, the 3D component of the mapping is what really interests us because we want to um, create a very interactive sort of uh, tool for things like universities or school kids. Um, get them off watching some meth heads um, uh, <laughs> mention targets. Uh, I'd rather go and watch, uh, you know, a shipwreck and do a virtual reality dive. <laughs> See your fault, Carmen. Um, okay. So one of the ones uh, we have sort of actively been doing at the moment, and this is where DSS um, and Carmen and the crew and the guys there has been looking after us, is taking us to the Tankari. Um, as some of you know, it's a, a really small wreck. It's only about 25 meters long, this particular um, um, sort of coastal uh, steamer. But really, really pretty. Absolutely uh, pretty as. And... Um, this is sort of a drawing um, that um, Rod Belling did. Um, and um, um, you can see um, there's not much to it, but I mean, you can literally do laps around this thing in uh, one dive, but um, there's quite a lot of interesting things to see, look and see. So we wanted, uh, we decided, you know what, it would be perfect wreck. It's in 60 meters of water. So we get, you know, plenty of time down there, um, half an hour to 45 minutes. Uh, we've been pushing um, sort of dives there lately and, you know, doing about 40, 45 minutes on the bottom. And um, we can pretty much scan nearly the whole wreck in that, uh, in that time. But there is one problem. And remember that um, my little complaint about the AU1 video with that stupid fish swimming in the way is a bloody fish. <laughs> Let's see if this video plays without having a heart attack. Fish everywhere. Come on, please play. What? Oh. How dare those fish get in the way of your filming? Well, it's a scanning. It's. Oh, uh, come on. Oh, uh, come on, NBN. There's too many people at home watching reality shows. That's what's happening with the internet. Death head target tamers. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on, move, move, move. All right, I'll try to move it to the interesting parts. Good luck. <laughs> I'm not having luck. The other video played all right. What's wrong with these ones? <laughs> Uh, I'm doing. Oh, well, at this we see Tom <laughs> doing his thing. <laughs> we have been lucky with visibility there on quite a few dives. Come on. The mere 
we've just had a question as to whether these videos are on YouTube. It might be, um, if they are, we might pop them, the links in for people to watch later. Um, <laughs> yep, let me just mute the, the music. Um, the, uh, these videos are on YouTube, uh, on the Sydney Project website uh, channel. Perfect. What I might do is get those links from you um, shortly and sure. um, Oliver, we will, I'll pop them up on our Facebook page for you to have a look at yep. later if you like. So also. as you can see over there, this behind this uh, wall of these horrible things, mm -hmm. uh, there's a shipwreck there. So try to point the camera and uh, do some scanning. Um, it's just relentless. So um, one of the things we did uh, just before we had all the um, coronavirus lockdowns, um, the last dive that we managed to do was about three, four weeks ago. And um, I've literally had to go rather close to the wreck uh, before the fish gave sort of a little bit of room to um, take some images. Those images at the moment are being processed as we speak. Okay, we sort of made it there. So we sort of um, managed to, um, um, to get uh, quite a few images on it and uh, they are with AJ who is our um, archaeology guru and uh, she is processing as we speak. But if you look, um, so I did like an experimental thing uh, with the propeller just so we can get our settings and stuff right because um, thanks to the Heritage Office, um, we've got a couple of cameras um, that they've been um, helping us with, uh, sort of using uh, lately. Uh, but these ones were taken with my old GoPro 3. So um, uh, the settings went sort of ideal. And I think Tom, some of the images that Tom took with his SLI yeah, as well. That's on the bottom right. All yeah. So you can see uh, on the right image where um, you've got the squares going around. So there are the um, points that uh, Agisoft software uses to do the scanning. So, um, and this is only like a handful. I mean, you can literally count them. There's like 16 images or whatever, and this is what we're getting. There's obviously a lot of information missing, so it cannot build a complete picture. So one of the things uh, to remember, um, and this is really important when you're doing photogrammetry, and this is some of the, um, the um, settings that you're taking. So take, if you're a photographer, you need to take this whole sort of creative uh, aspect of photography and throw it out the window. You are now setting this up uh, to do a, a something specifically boring. So the images have to be flat. They don't have, cannot be, uh, um, you know, pretty um, colors or, um, um, you know, you're not gonna set the aperture to um, get the black background or capture light here or whatever. You want as much light, you want to uh, remove as much noise as possible. You want to remove everything that is, um, in, is gonna interfere with getting a completely nice flat sort of image. And the other thing is, um, even we're talking about like with the truck lagoon where the visibility is fantastic and you can go wide on a really big shipwreck and take wide images. But what you need is you still need that 80% overlap of images. Some people will say, oh yeah, as long as I've got a comment reference um, in the image, I should be okay. No, you actually need to overlap by literally 80%. So um, I remember Pete was saying on, uh, I think San Francisco Maru, I think they've taken something like 5,000 pictures just to get that rake scanned between the two of them. So you literally, um, if you are scootering, for example, and you're setting your um, sort of photos to take one photo every second. So you literally just on time, on, um, time lapse and it just takes lots and lots of photos. So it's all about taking a lot of images. You want to give as much information to IGSoft to try and to do this. Also, you have to do it from every conceivable angle. Um, if you want to get that 3D, you gotta take that from every possible angle and you need good lighting. One of the problems is you cannot have shadows. IGSoft hates shadows. And if you've got shadows in the images, um, it will just uh, one know what to do with it. It's literally a hole in the information. 
What's also, the uh, what's the program that they use? To uh, it's called RGSoft. Oh, okay. Is that fairly new, Samir? Um, no, it's actually been around for quite a long time, but it uh, used to be um, quite expensive. Yeah. Uh, like now you can buy a standard edition for like $185, I think it is, uh, online. Yeah. Or a standard license um, or a professional license for, I think, $3,500. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? The standard license actually is quite powerful uh, for what you want to do. For what we're doing, it's actually um, quite good. Um, so I haven't played with it myself. I'm actually um, uh, will be getting um, just a standard license and learn it just for my own interest. Mm -hmm. But uh, AJ has been working with it. She did a course in Croatia with one of the guys, uh, sort of the experts in um, in um, 3D mapping and he's an expert in RGSoft. So I let her do um, all the sort of geeky stuff because she likes doing that anyway. And um, so, yeah, so again, um, and this is what we're talking about, poor light conditions. So if the lighting is really poor, visibility is really bad, you have to get really, really close to the object. And this is what we got to do with Tankari, unfortunately, with the fish. Even if the visibility is, you know, 30 meters, which it, a lot of times it does get in, um, the problem is with the amount of fish on it, it's you got to get really right up to the wreck and take lots of images uh, so that you can get a chance to get away from the fish. So one of the things, uh, just to give you an idea over here, so I just literally went in the garage and I thought, uh, I'll just take, photos of um, my rebreather and just to give you an idea and this is how you practice you know Marcus one of the guys who does stuff with Pete he actually uh, goes and takes um, images of his kid and his baby and makes a 3d model of her in RGSoft. soft you know some people go and scan their car or um, whatever you, it's all about just practice um, it's all about just uh, going taking as many images and just practicing so here is just an example of what it looks like in the software with all the different uh, points that it's uh, scanning. And, um, and this is what it looks like in, uh, in building progress. So for example, if I'm just taking only one part, as you can see, there's missing sort of holes in it. So that's all the information it gets. So if you have, um, if you have, um, if you have, uh, for example, uh, shadows, as I was saying before, what will happen is um, the program will literally will um, um, just have holes in it because it just creates, um, um, you know, missing parts of information. So you can see even with that limited amount of photos and just limited amount of information, you can still um, go in the software and um, just move it around and just see what parts of the um, you know, object you're scanning is missing and what parts you need to scan. And um, so it's a really, really uh, pretty cool tool. So this is what um, you can do with it. So Here's um, an example, and um, hopefully this plays. Now this guy is using a video. You can use video for scanning, but it's just not um, you don't get as much uh, detail as you can see it's not as much detail as if you would use still uh, still images but this is just in a single dive again in Croatia clear crystal clear water
So we get the idea. Now, um, what not to do? So, um, sorry, Liv, got to go back to this one. Um, so, when you, um, this is the um, motorbike in Shelley Beach, as a lot of you would know, people that live in Sydney. Um, so, I asked Liv, I said, Liv, uh, she was going diving over there, I think, with her parents that day. I thought, ah, oh, can you do me a favor? Can you just quickly grab a few uh, snaps of the motorbike because I couldn't get, get down there that day and uh, I might use it for the presentation that we did that day in um, uh, at the shop. And so um, Liv goes down there and goes, yeah, 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 I got the images. They send me the images and we'll put it in the Agisoft. And I'm looking, okay, well, first of all, that date, He's literally just killed every image. If you look on the right-hand side there, he just made a 3D version of that date and timestamp. So don't put date and timestamp. Just remove all that stuff. And uh, you can see the images, the little images down the bottom there. She's taken all very wide images of it. And um, it might have worked if the da date and stamp wasn't there, but <laughs> you just want to get in as close as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah it's it is look it's a learning curve it definitely is a huge huge learning curve so um if you want to um, um now this particularly here um well we don't really uh, i had i think i put it this from the previous um um talk that i did but uh, basically it's um if you on the youtube if you go to this uh, and you can do that now if you want if you go to um, you have to do it on your phone. Um, it's literally um, a YouTube app. Search for virtual dive on the rack of the uh, mock me, whatever it's called. And it's literally a 3D um, um, rendering. So you can go in there and use the app to, um, um, to um, you know, do a virtual dive through the ship rack. Just to give you an idea of what exactly, um, you know, we're trying to achieve. Obviously, a little bit, um, uh, better results than just this. We literally would want to have the stuff in Google Earth where people can go down to Google Earth and swim along the wreck, go inside the wreck, click on int points of interest, information will pop up, maybe animation, maybe even um, maybe even like um, reenactment. So um, we've got all these grand sort of ideas and um, um, you know things that we want to do and results we want to get. And obviously, it all takes time. It all t it's a bit of a learning curve for all of us. And mind you, uh, this whole photogrammetry sort of taken off like wildfire at the moment amongst all the tech divers and all the guys who are into shipwrecks. Um, but um, it's still in its infancy. So just, you know, the more people get out there, the more people do it, uh, you know, the more sort of interesting stuff we're going to get from different shipwrecks. And of course, um, we cannot do it um, just with a handful of people, we need help. We need as many people as we can get. Um, so, you know, Carmen and the crew, they've been huge help um, to, to achieve some of these goals. Uh, we've got the backing of the Heritage Office and we just want to get people interested in doing this sort of uh, stuff. I know there's a lot of people sort of getting into the technical diving and, um, you know, we're trying to get down the South Coast. We've been... Uh, going back there, unfortunately, this year is a question mark uh, whether we end up getting going there or not. Um, so this has been a bit of a tough last six months with fires and everything else. So um, yeah, unfortunately, um, a few people are itching to go back there, but um, we just have to sit and wait. And um, yeah, look, don't think of Sydney Project or any guys who involve the Sydney Project um, as some hardcore bunch of guys who cannot be approached or um, or even join in. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be a technical diver. You can be any kind of diver. You can be not even a non-diver, still be, um, you know, come and um, join us in some capacity. Come help us on the trips, uh, even on the boat, support diver, whatever, historical stuff, photogrammetry. You can do so much um, to, you know, get this up going you know we need uh, as many people uh, as we can so we just want people to enjoy as well and that's what it's all about at the end of the day it's all a lot of fun um and we you know 
like Mike and myself over the years, experienced um, stuff in Turkey, in New Guinea, Indonesia, and all because we're just doing this stuff locally. And that's how we end up getting called up. So, and a lot of the guys in the Sydney project as well. So we don't know where we're going to end up in the future, or where it's going to be. But I know the South Coast is still a very virgin territory. I mean, we still try to identify wrecks over there. So it's by no means uh, dived or overdived. So I will, I know we've been waffling for quite a long time now. So I'll um, open up to a few questions and all that. And yeah, go for it. Awesome. Samir, that was so interesting. Mark, thank you guys so much. And Tom for your input as well. Um, guys, do we have any questions at all? in the group, you can either unmute yourself and ask the question or pop it in the chat if you prefer. Um, any questions about any of that? Is, there, is anyone still uh, awake? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know for me, there's a couple of guys that I've got coming through, especially doing our technical courses that have been watching your videos and, and looking at what you've been doing on, on your Facebook and that kind of stuff and looking at really getting into doing this kind of diving with you guys. So what could you suggest for them as divers to, you know, even being support divers for you guys? Um, what, what would you suggest for those kinds of divers? Yep. So um, um, anyone who's coming through any level of technical diving, one of the best thing, and I'm talking just from my personal experience when we started doing all this stuff, is circle yourself around uh, people that are, you know, been doing this sort of type of diving, doesn't matter where they're from, where, who they are, um, doesn't matter who they affiliate with. If someone you find that is, has got no egos and extremely experienced, just be a sponge and try to circle yourself with these type of people. Cause that's what we did initially. You know, we had the fortune of being of, you know, around Dev Appley's and Simon Mitchell's and all the other sort of guys that uh, were doing all these great stuff. And um, what we tried to do, and the biggest problem in the past was, um, you know, everyone viewed technical divers as just really, just a bunch of assholes that they didn't want to have to do with uh, any uh, people that are, um, you know, beyond them sort of thing. And uh, we've sort of, and I, I think um, this now attitude changed over the years, so, you know, and, uh, as the big diving became more popular and we uh, really worked hard to try to uh, remove that sort of stigma of, um, you know, um, of the technical divers. So my advice is, you know, come and join people and whether they want to come um, uh, join us, we are more than welcome. And one of the things I say is, um, obviously, if we're going to go down and do a hundred meter, you know, wrecks uh, in really deep water in a hundred meters, it doesn't mean they cannot come on those trips. A lot of guys who even try mix qualified, they will come down and just do uh, support and get to see what is it involved doing this type of dives. How do we set up the sh um, the shot line? How do we set up the uh, deco station? How do we run the whole show with the supervisor and get divers in the water? because there's a lot of hard work that involves and people don't appreciate it. Even the last video that I put where I'm showing how we deploy and do all that stuff, it only shows a small fraction of it, but I just wanted to give people an idea of what it involves. Uh, but being there and just being around people and getting to know all the different characters, um, you appreciate and you learn. And I always say, listen, just come and be on the boat and just, be a sponge, absorb as much knowledge as possible, ask as many questions. And there's no stupid questions. You can ask anything. You can even ask about a P-valve. Believe it or not, that is a very technical question to ask. You know, It takes a long time to get the right um, P-valve and the right uh, catheter. That stuff is important when you're doing five-hour uh, decades. You know? um, and we've had a young kid, Samuel, who has been coming with us, uh, as you guys know, on the boat. Um, and um, uh, every time I'm scheduling a dive, he's like, can I come, can I come? And he's a 16 year old kid and he's just great. He just uh, wants to learn and he just uh, wants to get into that type of diving. And I'm more than happy to accommodate that. And you know, him and the old man came on the boat one day and he was just loving it, you know? And um, I said to him, I'm more than happy to pick you up in the morning and take you on early morning in the dive and 
we can you know just learn as much as possible so diving is one of them they got to go out and dive that's why a lot of people are just um, for some reason um, i see there's a lack of is uh, tech diving just jump on a boat just go and do the dives we're trying to we always uh, short on people just to go even to do um, the wrecks in on long reef or in 50 meters of water 45 meters of water and uh, i'm more than happy to um, you know instead of going to the tankari if these people want to go uh, not try mix qualified i tell them that's not a problem. Let's go do a boat you and just learn over there. And we just talk, talk about uh, everything diving and just, you know, people learn. So again, it's a uh, approach, take diving, you know, talk to everyone. I think there's, um, there's none of those people, everyone out there that I know is more than happy to help out and be helpful. So that's my sort of long winded answer to this. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Samir, we have a question from Oliver. Oliver, do you want to unmute and ask the question? Yeah, no, I was, I was just, uh, first of all, really, really cool talk. It was really nice to, nice to hear about what you guys have been doing. I'm, I mean, I've seen some of the stuff uh, on social media and such, but it's nice to, nice to really see exactly what's, what's happening. It's really, really cool. I was just wondering if you guys are using uh, photogrammetry for anything else except Rex. I mean, I guess Sydney Project's mostly Rex, but have you guys used it for anything else or? No, well, at the moment it's only shipwrecks. Uh, I know obviously uh, guys have been doing uh, stuff in the caves. So John Dillizwana, who has been doing a lot of stuff with Harry and Craig, he's been doing a lot of virtual reality stuff. And um, I have been talking to him quite a lot about it. And um, he is um, um, excited to help uh, when it comes to the virtual reality stuff. Um, so we, um, I mean, we're still sort of early days for us uh, with this stuff, but um, at the moment is just the Rex what we're interested in. One of the projects that we started uh, sort of, uh, I'm talking about 2010, going back even maybe a little bit earlier than that, one of the things we started was before even any of these tools were available, I used to get people to say, okay, when you dive on the South Coast, while you're on Dika, I'm sitting there for a long time, just to occupy yourself with something, and while your mind is still fresh, just remember the part of the wreck that you were at and just draw it on, the, on, the, on your notepad. So I used to get literally drawings from people who used to give me, and we used to tr put them together and try to create a little map of the wreck. And that was great. Uh, that was actually quite useful on some of the regs. But uh, obviously, um, these sort of tools are now available for us, and we want to utilize them. And of course, we want to utilize them. The ultimate goal is to go down the south coast and map all those regs in this deep water. Uh, William Dawes, uh, believe it or not, would be um, easier to do than the Tankari, even though it's really deep, really um, big, but it's crystal clear water, and there's no fish to um, get in the way. So it'll actually be easier to do than the Tankari, believe it or not. <laughs> and because um, you can go there with the scooter, just put on time lapse and just cruise gently and literally and should be able to um, do a big chunk of that rig. Um, so yeah, look, um, we've, we've done cave projects uh, as well. Um, uh, before, Mark has done a lot of stuff um, in McCavity and a lot of New South Wales caves. Um, I've done stuff in Tasmania and then uh, Malibu and all that. And um, yeah, absolutely, it would be great. But I mean, there's other guys who are a lot better than us um, that are doing the cave stuff. So um, there's no really point to uh, sort of try to do something that's, um, I, I, I mean, I love rakes. I mean, look, I love caves, but uh, to me, rakes are the ultimate challenge. They are going to be, to me, a rake in 140 meters of water in currents and swell is more difficult to dive than you know, you know, a deep cave um, in cold water. You know, it's it's, it's got both got challenges, but um, to me, it's just um, mapping shipwrecks is a huge challenge. So that's why we want to do all that. I think it was an anchor too. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And the thing is, with the, like things like William Dawes, I mean, we haven't even seen the stern. Uh, all this, well, sorry, we have seen it because we couldn't work out where, which part of the wreck we were diving each time because we were landing over there by mistake. 
but um, we need to do separate dives just to scan uh, the two parts of the uh, the reg. Uh, so you know, it's it's a big task. It's a challenge and a huge, huge challenge. But I think it's doable. But we have to start somewhere shallow first. And the wrecks of Sydney, they've got a lot of um, um, a lot of interest. Actually, I'm going to remove this. Uh, wow, I've got the. Um, let me just show the. Stop the share. Hold on. Am I back in the on the main screen? Am yes, I? Yeah, you are. Okay, that's better. Yeah. Otherwise, we're looking at this logger for no reason. So yeah, look. Uh, so, um, but like I said, um, we want to involve as many people as possible. Like Sean uh, Tommy, he's one of the guys who's um, uh, this guy is a bit of a, um, um, a genius when he comes to. Um, did I get his surname right? What's Sean's surname? Tom. Tom. Who? Tom. Uh, not uh, Sean, his name, Sean, I just forgot his last name. I've got it on my phone, I can look it up. Um, so Sean, is, uh, he's come with us, uh, he's uh, done stuff like on the Birchie and all that. And um, he is amazing. Sean, the stuff that he's doing at the moment, like in uh, truck, he is um, scanning um, airplanes. Sean, Tommy, yeah, I was right. So he's like T-W-O-M-E-Y. So what he's been doing is he would um, um, do a photogrammetry of an airplane and uh, where the collapse sections of the airplanes or shipwreck is, he will recreate animation, actually animate what the shipwreck looked like and how it disintegrated over time. And it looks incredible. It looks so much. So the possibilities of doing that sort of stuff is endless, uh, what you can do with it. So um, yeah to animate and bring those uh, wrecks on the south coast to life, oh, it would be spectacular because they are really spectacular wrecks. As Tom would um, tell you, especially, um, um, and Mark were talking about the, um, uh, you know, 100 meter plus visibility, because that's what we've had uh, a few times down there, is um, dropping down onto, um, well, we call it WTF or the cost farmer, and be able to see the whole wreck um, that's in 125 meters depth, from about 80 meters, you can see the whole wreck. It's spectacular. But you can only see that when the water is that incredibly clear. So the only way you can do it is by mapping it to be able to appreciate it. But, you know. We were pretty lucky the last time we went down there as well because we thought it was a coast farmer. And with the photos that we got and all our new data, we're thinking it could possibly something be another wreck. So even now we are finding, you know, new things and discovering them to making sure we know what they actually are and with all the new information we're getting. So we're still discovering like, you know, as of last year. And um, th with like, for example, with Tom, um, so Tom as a photographer, as uh, Mark with, you know, with yourself, with the previous projects, um, taking images and cl really clear images at those depth is not an easy task, but to get those images and invaluable because um, like Tom said, you can find inf new information every single time. I mean, we've been trying to get the idea of that wreck since 2006. So we are talking about 14 years now. I mean, out of those 14 years, I think six years of them took me um, that long to um, tell everyone that it wasn't the Iron Knight. Um, you know, it was a bit of, it's diff completely on story. It's a bit of an embarrassment for Heritage Office at the time. But, um, you know, it was something that needed to be done regardless. But um, it's causing me a lot of grief um, just try to identify, you know. And uh, look, um, the other thing is um, this, uh, I mean, the Tankari to me, I've actually, uh, the first time we did the Tankari, um, it was great. There was still a lot of stuff on it. And we actually got to dive it in really, really early days and uh, documented for the heritage office before it got uh, stripped to, uh, to bits. There was so much stuff that, you know, I'm, I can only show you in the videos. There's nothing left on it uh, that was uh, on there before. Uh, there's still broken bottles and stuff, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has been stolen over the time. And um, you know what? Uh, the amount of... Um, infighting and the amount of um, nastiness that went around because of that wreck, even back then, there was not much social media, but it was just like um, divers and all that. 
and I got blamed uh, for literally going there and plundering the wreck when we're the ones who are trying to tell everyone stop ripping stuff. Uh, it, it was it gave me grief. Like uh, for a while there, I wanted I didn't want to have anything to do with it because uh, I'm like thinking like we're doing this for fun. Why um people are being so nasty about uh, this stuff? And I even got people together at the Maritime Museum to go and actually go and map the whole wreck together. Lasted one dive, the next dive it all fell apart back to the same uh, thing. Um, so th there's a lot of that. And like I said, uh, the good thing about the whole uh, situation now is um, a lot of these sort of attitudes have gone away, you know? I mean, yeah, we used to have um, all these stroke versus GUE wars and all that sort of stuff. Still funny too, um, you know, but, uh, you know, like none of this nastiness exists anymore. You know, every, we all dive as well going there. It doesn't really matter how you dive. You just, just want to get in the water, you know? So, um, yeah. So look, like I said, we now get divers, GOE divers, non-GOE divers, you name it. Everyone joins and uh, for the sort of common sort of interests. So uh, like I said, um, yeah, you guys are more than welcome to join in some capacity. Don't ever think that, um, you cannot join in on do this. It's uh, like I said, it's a bit of a community we've been trying to build over the years and people come and go for different reasons. We had a lot of talented guys stop deep diving because they got married and had kids and you know, don't want to risk it. And that's fair enough. I just think they're soft, but uh, not fair enough. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, there you go. Mark has got cats now, so he stopped diving. <laughs> I haven't been doing much diving. No, I, I dive locally, but I sold my boat a couple of years ago. And with that, and, and being away from all you guys, I, I, there's no one up here who does technical diving. So um, it's not much fun going out doing it yourself. You have to move back to Sydney, Mark. Oh, maybe <laughs> Carmen. Yeah. Well, um, I, I miss aspects of Sydney and obviously my friends, you know, people out there. But um, uh, we've never regretted our move up here. It's been a nice uh, quality of life choice. But, but yeah, my diving, I thought I'd be doing heaps of it. But, um, you know, Sydney had Sydney Harbour, uh, Port Hacking, you know, whatever. You've got little bays and places you can go to. Water, where we are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that great area. <laughs> well, S Sydney Harbour's fantastic, you know. Um, but up here, um, great diving off the coast, but it's all wild, you know, like. Well, the killer water. No harbours. If the ocean's blown out because of seas or whatever, you can't. Right, guys. I'm so sorry. I think I'm going to wrap this up now just because yeah. it's 10 o'clock. So, um, oh, I know there's a lot of people that are probably, um, you know, to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> ready, to, ready to go to sleep. But, um, thank you so, so much for joining us, Samir. That was so interesting as always. Thank you very, very much. And, Mark, You're thank welcome. you so much for coming along. Thanks, Tom. Tom, for your input as always. Thank you so, so much for, uh, for keeping Samir on track. We know he needs it. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, guys, if you are interested in learning more about the Sydney Project, I will put the links to all of their socials anyway um, up on our, on our um, social channels so that you can get in contact with Samir. If uh, after all this um, lockdown is done, you do want to get in the water and get involved. It's a really, really cool project that they're working on. Um, Definitely, you know, well, like, like uh, Samir said, it's a really good opportunity to learn more, to go down that technical path if you want to, or even if you don't want to. Um, even I'm a recreational diver, I find it super interesting. Um, so please definitely get in touch with either us or the guys at the Sydney Project and, um, and definitely give it a shot. But um, thank you very, very much for joining us. And um, we look forward to having you in another one soon. So um, thanks, 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 Thomas. Thank you, guys, and thank you for joining us. Much appreciated, and we'll do it all again sometime. <laughs> thank you.